Well, hello everyone. It's very nice to see you for the first of our chats. So we'll be putting these up on Instagram and also in our podcast in the coming weeks and months in the lead up to the election. Now this morning after a big week in federal parliament and not necessarily in a good way, I'm joined by Sam Mostyn, who is the president of Chief Executive Women, but has a, a huge long and deep history across the spectrum of executive and government, uh, governance, business, sport, the arts, and indeed has worked in parliament herself. I'm a great admirer and Sam, I'm so pleased that you could join us today. Oh, it's so nice of you to ask me to join you, Zoe. Thanks so much. Just tell me your reflections on the week that we've had. I know a lot of women, especially those who work in Parliament House, have been kind of visibly affected by the latest developments. How has it made you feel? I reflected last night as, as Parliament was closing for the year, um, I was, I was, had very mixed emotions. I was sad, very, very saddened by what we're seeing. It just looked like the very worst way to, to talk about and to see democracy in action in the parliament. I felt really angry um, because of the build-up of just everything that has been happening, um, particularly for women, but not just women, and the failure to deal with those things in a way that's authentic and takes ownership. And, um, you know, in my world now, in in a non-political sense, in a non-government sense, working in business and in not-for-profits and just in the community generally, I just felt like there was a complete a chasm between what we saw happening in Canberra and what Kate had to report on in that workplace versus how we live our lives and how we, we think about work and good values everywhere else in, in the rest of our lives. So there's just this major disconnect. Um, and then, of course, immense immense um, sadness for the women involved who had finally been, been able to bring their stories forward to Kate. Um, you know, uh, someone bringing forward those, uh, those on the last day of the sitting um, um, calendar about a specific relationship and having to do that in front of cameras. You know, I thought that felt like we'd, re we'd reached a moment where um, we'd lost uh, um, some of our, our humanity of, that, that had, to, had, had to be done in front of cameras, in front of a press gallery, because um, she couldn't achieve any other solution to, a, to a, a very difficult issue. So I thought that just said so much about where we're at. And, um, but I did think that what Kate had done and the receipt of it by the community and about enough is enough. Um, and I, I really enjoyed listening to Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins on Fran Kelly's last broadcast um, yesterday on ABC Radio, just to hear two young women who had, at the beginning of the year, made us think, had not let go of this issue, had been incredibly brave, um, to hear them reflecting on um, both the successes of the year, but also how they think the world should be and how it really should be, how we should be thinking about it, um, and the expectations on all of us to be well behaved, to um, to have good values and to act in a decent way. Um, I guess I'm sort of turning around and just wanting to get on with it now. Yeah, well, uh, and that's kind of the point, isn't it? I mean, I, I guess I was reflecting too, having covered, you know, the, the genesis of the Me Too movement in, in the United States, where a lot of these stories came out and then Obviously, we've seen this sort of evolution here in Australia, particularly this year. But then, as you say, still to be on the last day of the sitting year, hearing more allegations and, and that feeling of, of sort of not only repulsion, really, but also just utter frustration about whether we are actually making progress or whether it's sort of lip service uh, you know, are the actions that are, are being taken um, real and and well-intentioned? What do you think? Well, there was a big opportunity this week for the parliament and the leadership in the parliament, particularly the government, to actually step up and give us confidence that not only had the message been heard, but the the evidence placed before it to be for, for a leader, for the prime minister, um, for the leader of the opposition, everyone involved in that moment to actually say, we now receive the evidence, we receive the reports and the recommendations, and we will act immediately. This is a matter of urgency. We do get it, and we'll, we'll get on with it. And instead, we heard more mealy-mouthed, it'll go to committees, it's got to be multi-party, we, we think we'll do you know, many of them. Whereas the rest of the world, you know, outside parliaments, have said, get on and do it. You know, please just accept the recommendations. There's nothing outrageous in those recommendations. They're actually holding that, that workplace to a standard that we expected ourselves everywhere. And, and so I felt that a, a moment of leadership was missed 
very much in the in the government and the parliament. Um, and we saw then, and even have, having had that report delivered, that pointed out so starkly the problems of that workplace and the issues of power and um, and gender inequality and the lack of women in leadership roles, um, the role of alcohol. That combined report told us something that should have been a big, big moment. And even in the hours after it was delivered and in the days after it was delivered, we saw some of the most obnoxious, unacceptable behaviour in the parliaments, in the houses of the parliament, um, despite that. And so there was almost like for some, a sense of who cares and it's not real. And that is not what I, I, I believe, I don't speak on behalf of all the community, but the, the, the places where I work, the, my family life, my community life, it is just unacceptable. And, uh, and conversely, in, you know, in different worlds, I mean, like the business world, this is the kind of behavior that had consequence over a decade ago. And we've been working hard in big organizations, um, often led by men, um, having to work on these things and actually accept um, the alcohol story and fix that, the power imbalances, setting targets for gender equity, um, dealing with complaints of bad behaviour from in whatever range. And so good business um, has set a standard that, the, that it feels like the parliament just doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And yet we keep talking about the parliament and our elected officials as somehow setting a standard. I mean, that's what Kate called her report. And to be leaders, I, th I thought the week was just terrible and rep does not represent how the rest of Australia thinks about good behaviour and leadership. No, it, it's interesting because, you know, this is obviously not just a women's issue. Um, you know, we, we're all in this, we're all involved in this, we all have a part to play in this, but something that really resonated with me this week is that I, I had a coffee with a, a local uh, older businessman um, just down in the electorate in Brighton and he suggested to me that the top issue for the election is gender equality, that he feels so angry um, yes. and really sort of offended by, by what's going on and, and that lack of progress. I wanted to ask you, Sam, I heard you being interviewed a couple of days ago and you talked about your own experiences working in Parliament House. Can you paint a picture of some of the personal experiences that you had? Yeah, very happy to. I, have, I don't normally talk about this stuff, but I felt in the context of um, of all the reports that Kate has had in that specific look at the Parliament federally, that it was appropriate to to talk reflect a little, a little bit on that time. Mm. Um, so I was an advisor in um, in the Keating government. I'm not a member of a political party, never have been, um, but the big policy ideas were happening at that time, and that was that was when I was available to be a policy advisor. So I worked for. Um, two ministers and the Prime Minister as a policy advisor. And I arrived in Canberra in my mid-20s, mid, mid to late 20s, um, having worked in law firms and, and um, not had any experience of working in the parliament in Canberra. And um, I, I remember arriving and as a young woman, um, a, a kind of dorky young woman, like I, I was there for policy reasons. I wanted to, to, to help um, a government make good decisions. Um, and I was, it was really quite shocking to just walk into a place that felt unlike any other place that I'd ever experienced. And it, it felt like a place that had its own rules. It was, it was in the new parliament house. So um, it felt like arriving at a spaceship that you, once you entered, there were sort of like no rules that applied at all. So um, a few things I was told when I arrived was to, if you're around late at night, look out for these men. And they were, they were all elected officials. Occasionally they were a senior advisor, but look out for these men um, on the prowl, if they've been drinking down in the in the members bar, um, don't, you know, take care of yourself. But they, you know, don't worry, it happens all the time. But just you know, let's get ready for that. I was told that the prayer room and the meditation room don't go near that at certain times of, of at lunchtime and at night because there'll be things going on in there because it's a really great secret spot. Um, like there was a sort of conditions of look, don't worry about it. It's this is what happens here, and it was it was kind of lousy or I'm trying to think of the word. It was really a kind of different set of values, um, and a lot and there weren't a lot of women um, in the parliament, so um, more women advisors um, and and women bureaucrats coming up to the house. Um, so and, and there wasn't quite the same pernicious kind of macho stuff going on. I think you see now almost like masters of the universe wandering in the the, part, the, the, the halls of, of power, but there was this sense that anything was fair game. And I was, um, on a couple of occasions, I had um, backbench senators um, who would seen me arrive, invite me down for a coffee at the, the cafe inside Parliament House at Aussies. And I took my pen and paper down to think they're interested in communications policy. And, um, and a couple of them said, yeah, are you up for an affair? I remember sitting and saying, sorry, <laughs> no, no. Um, oh, well, yeah, it's, it's a funny old place here away from family. It doesn't hurt anybody. 
you seem available, you seem nice. And, you know, it, again, it was the, the rules, system, the normal rules of good behaviour and of loyalty and fidelity, all that kind of stuff. It felt like a fly in, fly out environment. And I, it mm. sort of, in, in subsequent years, I've thought about the fact that we didn't ever talk about it like that. But it was no different to a mining site where you fly in for the week and almost what happens on site stays on site, the old rules of that stuff, mm. you know, the crazy mm. stuff that happens, the in-jokes, the, the relationships that form, and then when you come out, you go back to your families and another life. And so it had that feel to it. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like it was, that was all it was. It was a, um, back there in the 90s, it did feel much more substantial and, and there were lots of very good things happening. But there was just this undercurrent. Um, and I'd have to say that what it meant for the young people is you, you could be led into that kind of stuff of the drinking and behaviour um, it, it, it's sort of there were mores that were just being broken all the time um, and so it doesn't surprise me that then that then what we see 20 years later is the Brittany Higgins story um, and those late nights the alcohol fueled things very bad things happening no one taking account everything swept under the carpet so you know it, I think it's a place that needs a really good clean up and I think that's well, what Kate's report says it's pretty clear. Yes and you know it's that power imbalance isn't it with, with uh, young women and, and older men of, often in that dynamic. It, I, I want to talk about the sort of I guess two-party system issue within this is you know the government's been in the gun on this because of the developments this year but there's a suggestion that the ALP is kind of going soft on this because there's skeletons on on that side too Does, is that sort of i guess reflective of some sort of reverse bipartisanship that we we're not going to completely air this because there, there's so much in there that's messy that it will just be too damaging and then is that sort of holding us back in terms of making true progress short answer yes hmm. um I, mean, I think that's why it's so interesting to see what you're doing and the voices of independent movement across the country is I think people have got that, that, that story um, very clearly that in that place there's two parties, two major parties with some minor parties trying to hold people to account. But, yeah, I think there are certain things that just binds those parties in that environment to say, look, we'll all turn a blind eye to this because we don't, we don't, we don't want to be affected by it. And, and I think almost there's a detente around that often. Look, if we don't raise it about yours, you won't raise it about our, our, our bad stories. Mm. Like, that's terrible. That's, that's really, really terrible. And that's not how any um, functioning workplace or, or system of democracy can work because it lacks any kind of integrity and authority. I think that the independents have actually sat there on the cross benches and raised those issues over and over and brought them to our attention. Um, and I, th I do think it says that the, the, the two-party system has you know, significant weaknesses if you're not prepared to hold to your own truths and values and, and be prepared to face into it and say, yes, we do have our own problems and we'll deal with those too. Um, I, think it, I, think it's a, I think it also, I actually think the press gallery and the, the way the media is complicit in that place to the stories and secrets. Many of the things that have gone on, the press gallery has known about for a very long time. And there's mm. been really bad things happening in the press gallery with, with you know, the, so this behavioural thing about if we could all just not talk about it, then we'll all not get in trouble. Mm. But everyone's known so much about these very bad things. And, and then it explodes. And, and I think that's probably why some said that we're not surprised by it, because they've been watching it and living in it. Um, and it's been easier not to say anything for, every, for, for the party system. And yet it completely misses what the community expects of of acceptance of, of, um, of responsibility. And so I, th I think there's a real problem in that. And uh, you know, I wish there'd be a lot more honesty about that from all parties. Yeah, so let's flip the optimism switch here. Yes. And, and certainly in terms of what I'm launching into and, and trying to do is a very deliberate step to say, okay, well, I'm not gonna sit on the sidelines anymore. I'm gonna attempt to step in and, and try to support some change in various ways from the inside from, from being at the table. What are the things that we can do in terms of steps? You know, implementing Kate Jenkins' two reports, for example, other legislative measures to, to create true safety for women, not only in parliament, but in other workplaces. Well, I think much of that work is now being done by good employers. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I represent Chief Executive Women and, and amongst other things, we have called for the full acceptance of the 55 recommendations of Kate's first report and to accept all recommendations immediately as a matter of urgency with her set the, um, set the, um, set the standard report that came out this week. 
they're not very difficult things to do, Zoe. So there's the legislative side, which is really important and has not been completed, which sets the framework and the standards that we all have to be held to um, for workplaces, the Fair Work Act, those things that give us clarity around what the system is. What are, what are the guardrails that say, this is, this is what you're operating within. Then the rest of it is mostly cultural. It's the, it's the gender equity thing you raised earlier. So it is the appointment of more women and the pathways for more women to be in leadership roles so we can crack open this power imbalance. Um, and get the great benefit of women as decision makers, as leaders, as policy makers, or, or in my other world, you know, chief executives and, and leading organisations, because we know the presence of women as decision makers alongside men makes for better decision making, creates mm -hmm. greater value. And, and the data is in from the US that for every woman you add to a management team, you significantly reduce the presence of danger in the workplace. It's about a 10% factor for every woman who then arrives as a, as in a senior executive role. So something starts to happen and stabilises around an organisation and a workplace when you just begin to get leadership teams that look like the community that we live in. And so that's an important cultural and leadership moment. And then there's all the accountability. So holding people to account with consequence. So in the private sector, we've seen in recent years, chairman, chief executives lose their jobs um, when they have transgressed um, the values we expect in the workplace around safety and other things. Now, we've not seen that same consequence in our governments and parliaments. It's almost, there are excuses, there are reports, there are independent reviews. That just doesn't happen in the private sector anymore. There is this consequence. And I think consequence at a senior level sends an incredibly strong message to everyone in an organisation that no one's beyond reproach. So I'll behave well, but I expect my bosses to behave well. And if they don't, then I've got a whistleblower process or a way of bringing those matters to the attention of the right people, generally an HR team with a systems um, approach and fix them responsibly and ethically and decently and give people the right to actually have redress. Um, now, none of that's complicated. And in fact, if you're a well-run company with a good diverse set of leaders and you, you commit to these things and you are inclusive and you want an organisation where everyone belongs, you're clearing out all those big safety issues. And, you know, producing environments that are productive, great to work for, um, and it's what we want. And so um, it, but it does require intentional behaviour and, and a step up, and I, I think it's urgent. Um, it's certainly urgent in the, in the parliament, um, but I think we just we, we need to reflect community standards and values um, and, and give people hope and give people a sense that, that that's what leadership can look like and what good, what good organisations can look like. Before I let you go, I, I want to touch on a sort of bigger picture issue of revaluing women in our society and, and in our economy. This is something you and I've talked about quite a bit um, offline, but, you know, COVID exposed, for example, just how critical women are as workers in so many of our essential industries. And in my mind, it opens up a whole conversation about valuing those women revaluing their, their contribution as, as retail workers, as, as teachers, as nurses, as aged care workers, as you know, workers across the spectrum of um, medicine and, and such. Is that sort of part of the same conversation, that sort of revaluation of, of women's position? And it, does that sort of help also take this from a moral debate, which obviously it is, to, to an economic debate as well. So, so it gives it a, a kind of a different framework through which we can look at it too. Um, absolutely. I spoke at the press club about this last week on behalf of Chief Executive Women. I spent a month or so writing the speech and crafting it and thinking about how to actually tell that story. Because I guess like you and, and many people watching this podcast, throughout COVID, about every two weeks, another report landed that was the truth telling of what was happening in our economy and in our communities. You were involved in, you know, you, you saw the, the data that came through for the retail um, environment and the, the issue of, of, of just how, how hard things were going, how compounding things were going for families who couldn't get good shift work and weren't being treated well. But I kept seeing these um, reports about gender inequality, gender pay gaps, and then the really big ones about who was taking the big loads of keeping us safe and well through COVID and yet who were the most catastrophized through COVID? And it was women. And it just, I kept thinking, every time I hear a leader saying, we're gonna bounce back better, we're building better, we're gonna muscle up to the, the future post COVID. And then all these plans released around infrastructure that was always hard infrastructure with roads, construction sites, that kind of thing. I kept thinking, well, I've served on the board of a road 
company, Transurban. Um, I've seen the benefit of, of road infrastructure. I know what it does for an economy, but what kept us going through COVID? It was the infrastructure, the, the foundational infrastructure of care. It's a social infrastructure that we have underinvested in for decades, but particularly through this last um, decade or so. And who's doing most of the caring? Women. And, I, and, and what are they being paid? Either nothing or underpaid, um, undervalued, and sitting in this catastrophized world where um, they've seen themselves suffer even greater discrimination and hardship. And they've been doing the homeschooling and the care. They've been the women, um, in the, the nurses on the front line. They've been those, you know, the numbers tell us that 70 to 80% of that care workforce are women. Um, and so something has gone terribly wrong in what we value and what we care. And so we've been talking at CW about putting care at the center of the economy with all that that brings. And it's not just a women's story and it's not just a philosophical or cultural story. It's a big economic story that if we do that, you, know, you encourage men to have professions in the caring world, to be teachers, to be nurses, to, to actually go into early childhood care, elder care, and to allow women to feel that they can be in the higher income earning professions as well. So get, get more of a, an equality for what is work. But in that caring environment, if we continue to neglect investment in care as one of the greatest protective factors for our economy, into the future, you know, the, the Royal Commissions that we've had into elder abuse in the, in the aged care sector, disability care and childcare, we'll, we'll be back looking at the fact that we just didn't care and, the, and that terrible problem, that, that horrible stories we hear about people who then aren't cared for in the care system because the workforces haven't been built to do their job well. Um, and so then we have a community, a societal issue, so hang on, but we're okay about, um, about just relying on women to do that for free. And, and not be not be respected. That, and a, a society can't keep going on that basis. And the way I framed the speech at the time was to say, we're just running out of luck. You know, we've been lucky to have women taking on those, that burden of care, either unpaid or underpaid. And then COVID just showed us what happens in a crisis, that burden again falls on women. And we're, if we wanna get out of COVID really, really well, then care, gender equality, dealing with these issues of behavior, a thriving community, that actually values the things that we know matter in our communities. That's a huge economic story, you know, huge economic opportunities. And it doesn't mean we don't also invest in, in the traditional forms of, of infrastructure. It just means we give this intentional focus. And the jobs in that, it's, it's jobs rich, it respects women. Um, and I think it reflects what our communities are feeling in their guts around what, what's been going wrong um, in our system to date. Yeah, I think that whole area is really exciting and it's something I'm really keen to work on. So I look forward to talking to you more about that. Sam, thanks so much. It's been lovely talking to you, Zoe. Thank you.